It's good to be back with you. I think the last time we were here was in July. It's always wonderful to be with you folks and open up God's word with you. Let's open in a word of prayer to ask the Lord to bless our time together in Scripture. Our great God of highest heaven, we come before you praising you, glorifying you, thanking you for who you are. You are majestic above the nations, exalted in the heavens, and we praise you for your majesty and for your grace. Lord, we thank you for your word, the blessings of your word, how it instructs us, how it teaches us to walk day by day, how it draws us ever closer to you. And as we look to your word and the excellencies of your word this evening, I ask that your Holy Spirit would enlighten our hearts and our minds. Uh, may you be with me as I proclaim your word. May you be with those who are here tonight who are believers. May this draw them closer to you. And if there's someone here who is not a believer, who is at enmity with you, who is at war with you, I ask that you would convict their hearts and grant them faith and repentance. We thank you. We love you. We praise you for the privilege we have of serving you, our most glorious and gracious King. We ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Today we'll be looking at Psalm 119. Please open up your Bibles to Psalm 119. And we're going to be in verses 57 through 64. Psalm 119, verses 57 through 64, the eighth stanza of this psalm. And the title for tonight's message is Staying in Step with God. Staying in Step with God. Beginning in verse 57, the psalmist writes, Yahweh is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. I have sought to please your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your word. I thought upon my ways, and I turned my feet to your testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Yahweh, is full of your loving kindness. Teach me your statutes. Well, I know that many of you have heard messages and sermons on Psalm 119 before. It's a glorious psalm. Uh, so before I begin, I'll just remind you of some of the context of this psalm before we dive in. Obviously, it is the longest psalm in Scripture. It's more than twice as long as any other psalm in the Scriptures, and it's an acrostic psalm, meaning that there are 22 stanzas in the psalm, each made up of eight verses, and each verse in each stanza begins with the same Hebrew letter. So in our stanza tonight, the uh, first letter of the uh, verse of each verse begins with the Hebrew letter Heth. Now, sometimes that doesn't translate well in our English Bibles, but in the Hebrew Bible, the beginning letter of every verse in this psalm is the same letter. And an acrostic psalm shows us that the subject is being covered exhaustively. It is an exhaustive examination of uh, this particular subject, and the subject of Psalm 119 is the word of God. Uh, Proverbs 31 is a, a very famous passage. It's about the woman, the virtuous woman, and it is also an acrostic. And it is looking at the, the woman in Proverbs 31 exhaustively as the, an example of what a, a righteous woman is. And in the same way we see with Psalm 119, it is an exhaustive look at God's word. There are many different words in the psalm that are used to describe Scripture. And we will see several of them as we go throughout this stanza this evening. And each has a slightly different nuance to it, a slightly different meaning, a slightly different facet of God's word that the author wants to bring out when he uses various words, such as testimonies, commandments, judgments, etc. And we'll see many of these in our stanza tonight. Now, who was Psalm 119 written by? I couldn't tell you. Uh, some people think it's David. It might be Ezra. It's possibly Daniel. I lean towards Daniel myself from various things in the psalm, but we really don't know. And, and really, that's not the, the, the focus of the psalm. The focus is God's word. 
And so let's go and start with verse 57 as our introduction. And again, the, the topic of this stanza is staying in step with God. And in verse 57, we see that the psalmist is looking back from his present time. He's in a present happy condition, a happy state in his life. He's in step with God. He's in relationship with God. And we see that as the uh, opening verse, verse 57, uh, opens up this, this particular stanza. The stanza begins with Yahweh. Yahweh is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. Now, the word Yahweh is, of course, the covenant name for God. I am. We see that it's given to Moses in Exodus 3.14. When Moses asks God, he says, well, if you tell me to go to Israel, whom shall I say sent me? And God says, I am, or Yahweh. It is the covenant name, the relational name of God, meaning that he is in a relationship with Israel and, and with his people. So we see from the beginning that the psalmist is a believer, and this psalm is written to believers. So the author is a believer, and it's written to believers. That's the audience of this psalm. And we see that Yahweh, that the, the, the psalmist is in a relationship with Yahweh, and he says something very interesting. He says, Yahweh is my portion. And when we see the word portion, I'm not talking about the large portion that you eat on Thanksgiving. No, this is a portion, this is an inheritance that the, that the psalmist is talking about here. It's very similar to the portion of the Levites. So when the children of Israel entered into the promised land, each tribe is given a portion, an inheritance, a specific section of land that they're allotted. Every tribe has this section of land, aside from the Levites. They have a few cities, cities of refuge, but the portion of the Levites is Yahweh. Yahweh is their inheritance. And we see that in Deuteronomy 10, verse 19, for example. And so here, in a very similar way, the psalmist is saying, the Lord is my inheritance. He's my portion. I'm not waiting for land or titles or money. No, my inheritance is... What's going to fulfill me and sustain me is the Lord. And a side note, I think this is one thing that might support a Daniel authorship or, or perhaps an exilic authorship because Daniel is out of the land and therefore the, the portion that he can only inherit is the Lord. But again, it's not certain. Nevertheless, the psalmist wants nothing else, regardless of whether he's in Israel, out of Israel. The only thing that he wants is a relationship with Yahweh. He wants to stay close to the Lord. But how? How can he do this? How can he stay in step with the Lord? In the army, when soldiers are marching in formation, they have to march in step, in unison, in synchronization. And to do that, they go off of a cadence, off of a beat that they have to follow. Sometimes it's a drum that beats, and they know, okay, every time the drum sounds, I my, my left foot hits the ground, or maybe the angry drill sergeant is yelling at them, and that helps them stay in step. But nevertheless, they're, they're, they hear, they listen for something uh, that'll keep them in step. And in a similar way, the psalmist in this psalm is, is looking for how do, I, how do I make sure that Yahweh, that the Lord, is my portion? Well, we see it at the end of verse 57. It says, I have promised to keep your words. This is the word of God. So he listens for God's word, the instructions of God's word for how to stay in step with God. But you might ask, okay, I, I understand I need to go to God's word. I'm not to go to anything else. I go to God's word. I don't go to my own emotions, my own feelings. No, I go to God's word. But, but I, that's great, but I need to dig down a little bit deeper. How do I do that? And so the psalmist, over the next seven verses, is going to lay out six strategies that should help you stay in step with God in your Christian walk. Six strategies for how you, that should help you stay in step with God in your Christian walk. And we're going to look at the first one, which is in verse 58. And the first strategy for staying in step with God is to seek God's face. Let's look at verse 58. It says, I have sought to please your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your word. Now, when the psalmist says, I've sought to please your face, he's entreating the favor, the blessing 
of God upon his life. This is a prayer of the psalmist. He's pleading with the Lord. He's praying to the Lord. The psalmist comes into the presence of God through his prayer. He's coming to the face of God. And in Scripture, the face of God, obviously God is a spirit. He has no physical face. He has no physical hands. So how does the psalmist come to the face of God to please God? Well, it's talking about coming into the presence of the Lord through his worship and through his prayer. And we see many expressions of this in Scripture. Uh, I'm not going to have you turn there, but I'm going to read to you a passage from Numbers chapter 6. And this is a blessing that uh, Yahweh says to Moses in Numbers chapter 6, verse 22. He always spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his face on you and give you peace. And so here in Psalm 119, the author is kind of looking back to this promise that God has given to the children of Israel all the way back in the law. And so he is coming into the presence of God. He's seeking the Lord. And what's, how's he doing it? Well, with all of his heart. The psalmist isn't doing anything by half measure here. This is, this is a full commitment. This is a totality of the psalmist's life. His heart it is devoted to seeking the face of God. And then he has a request when he seeks God's face. Look at the latter half of verse 58. He says, be gracious to me according to your word. He's asking for grace, for mercy. Remember, the the psalmist is a believer. But at one point, he wasn't a believer. God has graciously and mercifully saved him. And even though he's regenerated, even though he's saved, he still is seeking the Lord's grace and mercy. Because he, like you and I, are still sinners if we're believers. We're still prone to wander from the Lord. And so he asks for God to be gracious to him. But what's the channel of this grace? How is God going to be gracious to the psalmist? Well, the psalmist tells us. He says, be gracious to me according to your word. And so the the psalmist, when he prays, is seeking God's face. He's praying to the Lord. And how does God respond? He doesn't respond with a booming voice. He doesn't respond with a message written in the clouds. He doesn't respond with some inner, still, small voice. No, he responds through God's word. And my encouragement to you, when you seek the face of the Lord, when you pray, is not to wait for some message in the clouds or a still, small voice, but to seek God's word. For that will be how God answers your prayers. So, firstly, the first strategy for walking in step with God is to seek God's face. The second strategy is in verse 59, and that's to consider your way. Consider your way. The psalmist says, I thought upon my ways, and I turned my feet to your testimonies. He thought on his ways. He meditated on them. He examined his life, as the Apostle Paul warns us to do in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Paul says, examine yourself, test your own faith. This is something that the psalmist is doing here. He's thinking on his way. And of course, the word way here implies that the manner that he's conducting his life. This is a term that was often used in the early Christian church. Uh, When they only had the Old Testament, the believers, the followers of Jesus, were often called the followers of the way. Why? Well, they were following the way of the Lord. The manner of their life was in step with God. And so the psalmist here is thinking on his way, he's looking at his life, and he's considering it. When I was a young child, and I would do something to displease my parents, or I was disobedient, or I was mean to my siblings, my mother would sometimes, very rarely, she might question the rarely part, but she would tell me, go to your room and think about what you did. That was never a good thing to hear because I knew after considering my way in my room and thinking about it, there probably would be further punishments to come. But it was good for me to go and think, okay, I have sinned, I have I've disobeyed my parents, whatever, I need to consider my way. And so the psalmist is considering his way, his life. 
And this is something that you should do if you're a believer, but it's certainly something you should do if you're not a believer. Perhaps you're not walking on the way of God, the way of the Lord this evening. And you maybe are like the prodigal son who have run away from God and are currently sitting in the pig pen of your sin. And how does the prodigal son return? Well, it says when the prodigal son is sitting in that pig pen, he came to himself. He reflected on his life, he meditated on his way, and he repented and returned to the Lord. Yet it's not simply introspection that the psalmist is doing here. He's not sitting and meditating in some sort of Eastern mysticism way. No, there's an external standard to his meditation. He's measuring up how his life is being compared to something. And what is that? Well, I thought upon my way, and then I turned my feet to your testimonies. The word testimonies here is a term for scripture, but it has a very nuanced term. It implies the legal conditions that are set forth in God's word, the legal statutes of God's word. You know, those parts in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that we all start reading in January and February in our Bible reading plans and then kind of stop. That's what he's meditating on here. Why is that? Uh, he, he very likely might be in exile. He's not able to fulfill a lot of these things because they're specific to the land of Israel and the nation of Israel when they're in the land. Why would he meditate and think about those things? Well, because the testimonies of God, the legal conditions of God's word, are a reflection of God's character, his nature. If you look at the laws of Scripture, they're orderly. That points us to a God who is orderly. They are righteous, meaning that the God who instituted these testimonies are also righteous. And so the psalmist is considering his way and he's measuring it up according to what Scripture says. When he measures his way, he says, I turned my feet. And again, this implies walking, the way he is living his life. And he turns, meaning he repents, turns from either his sin or vain thoughts. And if you're an unbeliever this evening, that is what you must do. You must repent of your sin and turn to Christ. Yet repentance does not end when you become a Christian. Indeed, if you're a Christian, you should be repenting daily of your sin and turning to Christ daily, not necessarily for justification, but as part of your sanctification, becoming more like Christ. This is a mark of a true believer, someone who is constantly looking at his life and turning away from those areas where one is sinning or perhaps living vainly, meaning that you are not necessarily doing something that's sinful per se, but maybe you're not living your life to the glory of the Lord. And so that's what the psalmist is doing. He's turning from that. And this is something that we see elsewhere in Scripture. Turn with me quickly. Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18. Keep your finger in Psalm 119, but turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 27 and 28. And in these verses, Yahweh, the Lord, is giving a proverb concerning Israel. And he says something quite fascinating in verse 27. He's speaking of a wicked man, someone who's not a believer. In Ezekiel 18, 27, he says, Again, when a wicked man turns away from his wickedness, which he has done, and does justice and righteousness, he will preserve his life. Again, he, the wicked one, considered and turned away from all his transgressions, which he had done. He shall surely live, he shall not die. And so if you are an unbeliever this evening, if you're one of those wicked ones, consider your life and turn away from your wickedness. Turn to the Lord. If we go back to Psalm 119, we see that is what the psalmist has done in the past, and that is what he does continually. It's a continual pattern in his life. And, you know, if you do that, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, God will hear your prayer. If you're a Christian uh, or not a Christian, 1 John 1.9 is speaking to Christians, but it's applicable to non-Christians as well. If you confess your sin, he, the Lord, is faithful and righteous to forgive you of your sin. So the second strategy for staying in step with God is to consider your way. Thirdly, keep God's commandments. Verse 60, keep God's commandments. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. The word hastened here 
is to move quickly. This is the nature of genuine obedience, to do so promptly. Again, when I was a child, and if my parents told me to do the dishes or take out the garbage, and I said, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir, I would, and then they went away, and I was playing or doing something, and they came back ten minutes later, and I intended to take out the garbage, well, I was still being sinful. Why? As my mom would always say, delayed obedience is disobedience, and she was pointing to a truth from Scripture. And here the psalmist says, I hastened, I did not delay. This is an emphatic expression. Um, he's, he's saying, I did not delay to do this. He's keeping a short account with his life. If he sees something in his life that is ungodly, sinful, he is quick to turn from it, to turn to God's testimonies, and then to keep God's commandments. And the word commandments here implies generally Scripture as a, as a total idea, the entirety of Scripture. And so my exhortation to you tonight is if you have any area of sin that you are clinging on to, you, that, one, that one besetting sin, turn from it. Keep a short account in your life. Repent quickly and openly. And then keep God's commandments. We see here the word to keep. It's our second use. The psalm is second use in this psalm. We will see it three times throughout the psalm. And it has the idea of not only keeping, but observing closely, guarding carefully, as a, as a sentry would guard uh, an important outpost. And we see multiple examples of this in Scripture, of someone being exposed and showing their, or seeing their sin for what it is and turning to the Lord. We think of Matthew, the tax collector, who's in the tax booth. And the Lord comes and calls him. What does Matthew do? do? He doesn't delay. He immediately leaves his tax booth. He goes and he, he throws a dinner for, for, for the Lord and his disciples. And not only does he call them, he calls all of his friends, the sinners and the publicans. And he follows after the Lord. Think of the Philippian jailer who has imprisoned Paul and Silas. And then the great earthquake happens and the prison is burst open and the jailer is about to kill himself. And so Paul and Silas say, no, we are here. He comes down and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he repents immediately. What does he do? He immediately brings them out of the dungeon, washes their wounds, proclaims the gospel to his family or allows them to, and they become Christians as well. Think of Zacchaeus on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. When the Lord says, I'm coming to your house this evening, Zacchaeus repents and immediately repays all that he has taken. Hasten, do not delay to follow the Lord and keep his commandments. That is our third strategy for staying in step with the Lord. Fourthly, we are to remember God's law. Look at verse 61. The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. The word cords here speaks of ropes or snares. We see this idea throughout Scripture. Some of you might remember from Proverbs 1.17. There's a net set for, for birds meant to capture and ensnare them. It has the same idea. Or, or Psalm 140 verse 5 speaks of laying out a snare to kill the unsuspecting. And who does this? Well, it's the wicked ones, those persecutors. Throughout Psalm 119, repeatedly, over and over again, the psalmist is confronted with antagonists, arrogant, proud, wicked ones who are seeking to destroy him, to, to capture him, to even kill him because of his adherence to God's law. And now they have encircled him. Now, of course, he should not be surprised, and neither should we, when we experience such opposition from those who are enemies of God. Jesus says in John 15, 18, the world hates you. If the world hates you, know that it has first hated me. And so we should expect this if we are believers. And the psalmist here is confronting this very issue. He's being encircled. He's being surrounded with rope. How many times is Daniel, and when he is in Babylon and, and in Persia, surrounded by his enemies, seeking his death? And what does he do? When, when the enemies of Daniel make Darius, or they advise Darius to make a decree saying, only pray to Darius, you can't pray to anyone else. Does Daniel say, well, I can forget God's law temporarily, I'll wait 30 days and then I will pray? No. He goes and he throws open the windows towards Jerusalem and he prays three times a day as he always would do. He does not forget God's law, and that's what the psalmist says here. I have not forgotten your law. And to not forget means to not let pass from his mind. 
He, he stays faithful even amidst persecution. One can't help but think of John Bunyan. Uh, a couple weeks ago in the youth group that I teach at, we talked about John Bunyan and his story. And many of you know John Bunyan wrote the famous novel Pilgrim's Progress, which is an allegory of the Christian life. And I'm sure some of you also know that John Bunyan wrote that in jail, actually his second stint in jail. He had been thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. And he remained in jail for 12 years, even though his wife was expecting when he went in jail and he had three other children. And he goes in jail and he's told, you can, you can come out of jail anytime you want. You just have to promise not to preach. And he remains faithful. He does not forget God's law. And that's the type of idea that the psalmist is describing here. He does not forget the law of God. And again, the law of God speaks to the totality of Scripture. It speaks generally to the Torah, but largely to the totality of, uh, in this case, the Old Testament. And so the, the psalmist does not forget God's law. But how about you? When you're faced with affliction, with trials, with temptations, do you remember God's word when it gets tough? When the psalmist says he doesn't forget, this implies that he knows God's word in the first place. You can't forget something if you don't know it. And my encouragement to you is if you're facing trials and temptations, is to not forget God's law by first knowing God's law, meaning studying scripture, meditating on it, and memorizing it so it's part of your daily routine. So to stay in step with God, remember his law. Fifthly, in verse 62, we are to praise God's judgments. At midnight, I will Rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments, the psalmist says. At midnight, that's in the middle of the night, in the quiet part of the evening, you know, persecution brings sleeplessness. Uh, affliction being, brings sleeplessness. Maybe to ourselves or maybe to those that we love. Uh, some of you are mothers in the room. Perhaps you have a child that has wandered far from the Lord and perhaps that wakes you up in the middle of the night. And when you do... Are you praising God's judgments? Charles Bridges says that the Christian's darkest hour is 10,000 times brighter than the brightest day of the ungodly. Why? Because even in the middle of the night, in the night watches, we can commune with the Lord. And that's what the psalmist does here amidst his persecution. Indeed, it says that he rises and gives thanks. Do you know what the Hebrew word for give thanks means? It means to give thanks. That's what he's doing. We are to give thanks to God and praise his character and his nature despite our circumstances. I mean, the psalmist is being persecuted. He's perhaps being beset by sin and he's sleepless and yet he rises and gives thanks. And why is that? Well, it's because of the righteous judgments. And the word judgments here is another term that gives us a particular facet of Scripture, an idea of Scripture. And it, the word judgments in Psalm 119 is describing God's word as the standard by which we are judged by God. It is the righteous standard, as we see here. It is a righteous judgment. For man to be righteous, we have to be in accords with God's law. Well, how is God's law, if that's the standard, how can it be righteous if it's the standard? Well, when we think of God and we say God is righteous, we're not saying that God is in accords with his law, although he certainly is. What we're saying, though, is that God is in accords with his nature, meaning God will, is righteous because he never does anything outside of his nature. And so the idea of a square circle or God being able, making a rock too heavy to move is just ridiculous because it is outside of God's nature. He never does anything against his nature. And therefore, his judgments are also righteous. They are in line with his nature. Now think about this for a second. The psalmist is amidst persecution. He's sleepless. He wakes up in the middle of the night and he gives thanks. But what is the thing he's giving thanks for? It's not the faithfulness of God. Oh, that certainly is something he's giving thanks for. No, he's giving thanks, though, for the righteous judgments of God, God's word, the very standards by which the psalmist is being evaluated by God. The psalmist is a believer. He's following after God. But is he righteous? In a sense, yes, he is. He's following after God. But in another sense, are any of us righteous on our own? Certainly not. Certainly not. 
It's only when the righteousness of Christ is imputed to our account that we are considered righteous. And the psalmist here is following after God, and God has been gracious, as we saw in verse 58, and has imputed his own righteousness here to the psalmist. And so this is what the psalmist is praising God for. How often do you praise God in your life for the standards by which God judges you? Think about it. Those standards, that the righteous standards of God, none of us could ever keep. Christ had to keep them for us and, there, and by which we are saved. But those righteous standards are also the means that God uses to sanctify us. In our Christian walk, as we're trying to stay in step with God, we look to God's righteous standards, his law, and we say, oh, I'm falling short here. Lord, please help me. Help me to follow after your law. Please equip me with your righteousness. And so that is what the psalmist is doing here. He is praising God's judgments. And that is our fifth strategy. Our sixth and last strategy is found in verse 63. And that is to accompany God's people. The psalmist says, accompany God's people. Verse 63, I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The word companion here implies a close connection. This isn't a bowling buddy. This isn't someone that you see at the supermarket every once in a while. No, this is a very close companion. Malachi chapter 2, verse 14 uses this word to describe a marriage companion, a husband or a wife. This is someone very close. And the psalmist says that he's a companion of those that fear you, fear God. And of course, we know by fear, we're not talking about terror in the regular sense of the word. We're talking about a reverent fear, a salvific fear, a fear of the Lord. The fear described in Proverbs 1, verse 17, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so the psalmist is saying that he is a companion, a close companion of those who are believers, who are who are following after God. And not only are they believers, but we see at the end of this verse, they are those who keep your precepts. And this is our third use of the word keep in the psalm. Again, it means to guard or watch closely. And they're keeping the precepts of God. And precepts is another term in the psalm that is used to describe a different facet of God's word. And the word precepts means the step-by-step -step instructions that God's word gives us for how to live our lives. And so he's a close companion, not only of believers, other believers, but of those who are keeping, guarding, observing closely the step-by-step -step way to live life. And what an exhortation that is for us as believers. Now, many of us might have secular co-workers. We're working in the secular world, and, and we might even get close, very close, with some of our, the people that we know. Um, and, and that's fine to have secular friendships. However, your close companions should not be the world. They should be fellow believers. Um, whether that is a, a spouse who is a believer, or whether that's your brothers and sisters in Christ here at this church. You are to walk step by step with them. You are to be a close companion of them. Now think about this. If, if the psalmist is a close companion with someone who's walking in step with God, what does that mean the psalmist has to be doing? He's now walking in step with God. You know, I was talking earlier about uh, marching in the military, and there's a drum or maybe a drill sergeant yelling out the cadence, and that's how you hear. But even if you're deaf, you can still stay in step. How? Well, you're marching with people to your right and your left. And you say, oh, their right foot's hitting the ground at this time. My right foot should be hitting the ground at this time. And so even if we're, we, are, we are cut off uh, or we are, we are struggling in our life, we can look to others around us, believers, to encourage us in our Christian walk, those who are in step with God. Thomas Watson, the, the great Puritan, once stated that association begats assimilation. In other words, who you hang around is who you're going to become. And this is the importance of church. Why are you all here? And I know I'm preaching to the choir, so to speak. You all are here on Sunday night, on a, I guess, cold night. I'm from Pennsylvania. My wife's from Colorado, so it's just cold. But you're here on a cold night or a colder night. Why are you here? It's certainly not, to, I mean, yes, you're here to hear God's word, but if it was just that, you could watch it online, couldn't you? 
Why are you here with one another? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, a very famous passage, one that I'm sure you know well. Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to look at verse 25. And if one thing that COVID taught us is that you can't just do church online. You need to assemble together. Hebrews 10, 25, it says, Don't forsake, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, obviously, we're to gather together to hear God's words, to glorify Him, to worship Him through singing, through the Word, taking the Lord's Supper, partaking in the elements. Yet, here, the writer of Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. Why? So that you might encourage or you might exhort one another. This is the idea that the psalmist is talking about. He's a close companion of those who are walking with God. And that's why it is so important to regularly associate yourselves with other believers. So my exhortation for you is who are your close companions? Maybe you have a hobby that you like doing, and you have friends that do that hobby, but they're not believers. Not that you can't hang out with them, but should they be your close companions? No, brothers and sisters, look around you. These should be the people that you're associating with, who are your close companions, who are holding you accountable in your lives and encouraging and exhorting you. And so the sixth strategy for, for staying in step with God is to accompany God's people. As we get to the end of the psalm in verse 64, we have to ask ourselves, what is the result of staying in step with God? You remember, verse 57 is kind of the psalmist looking back at his life. He's in a present state of happiness, and he's looking back and listing the six ways that he followed and stayed in step with the Lord. And verse 64 gives us the result. The psalmist writes, The earth, O Yahweh, is full of your loving kindness. Teach me your statutes. I propose to you there are three results from staying in step with God that the psalmist gives us here. The first is a recognition of God's character. The second is the recognition of his own dependence on God. And third is a plea for divine instruction. And we're going to look at each of those in turn. First, the recognition of God's character. Notice the earth, O Yahweh. We see that term, that word for the Lord. It bookends our psalm. And the psalmist is, again, looking back to the covenant nature of God. He's, he's reminded of the faithfulness of God. He's looking to God and he's recognizing something about God's character. By staying in step with God, he's learned something about the Lord. And what is it? That not only is Yahweh faithful, which is implied in his name, but we find that the earth is full of Yahweh's loving kindness. And the word loving kindness here is the word... Uh, for mercy in the New Testament, or grace. It often describes, uh, if it was in the, in the Septuagint, it's often used to describe salvation. And so this is what we see here, that the God's mercy, his grace, his goodness, is over, over all the earth. The earth is full of it. I mean, think about it. We go outside, and you see a beautiful sunset. If you're an unbeliever, you've suppressed the truth, truth and unrighteousness. You don't think of God. But if you're a believer and you go out and you look at that beautiful sunset, it speaks to us. How? It tells us, well, there's beauty. How do we understand that beauty? Because God is a God of beauty. We, we can understand beauty because only through, through God and through, through, through his revelation to us. In the same way, truth, if we look to God's word, how do we understand that? We don't find truth. We don't understand it or, or, or find it on our own accord. No, it's the Lord who reveals it to us through his word. And so we see in, in, in the earth, in this, the psalmist is looking at the earth, and he sees that it's full of your loving kindness. And this isn't just speaking of the, the common grace that we see. This is also speaking of salvation. If we look around, I look around this room, I see this room is presumably full of examples, pictures of God's loving kindness. God has, if you're a believer, mercifully saved you. And that tells me something not only about you, but more importantly, tells me something about God. And who God is. Next we see that the psalmist recognizes his own dependence on the Lord. This is a result of staying in step with God. The latter part of the verse says, teach me your statutes. 
By teach me, he's recognizing his need for the Lord. Again, the psalmist doesn't have access to truth outside of God. He needs the Lord to teach him, to instruct him. He recognizes that God is eternal. I mean, the earth is full of his love and kindness. God is boundless and infinite. And yet the psalmist recognizes that he is finite, that he is temporal, foolish at times, and sinful. And he recognizes that without God, he is lost. He is dependent on the Lord. And that's why he pleads with the Lord to teach me. Indeed, there are only two requests that the psalmist makes throughout this entire psalm. The first is in verse 58. Be gracious to me. It's a pleading in that prayer that he prays. And here it says, teach me. And this leads us to our our third result of staying in step with God. where We learn to plead for God's instruction, for his teaching. Teach me your statutes. And you guessed it, the word statutes is another term for scripture. And it speaks of the codified, permanent law of God. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Uh, Another, and I'm blanking on the psalm, um, but that's what the the psalm, the psalms tell us that God's word is settled forever in heaven. Because why? Well, because likewise, God is, is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is permanent. And therefore, the psalmist is is pleading for the Lord to teach him these statutes. This is a reflection, again, of God's character. The psalmist is pleading in verse 58 for the Lord to be gracious to him, and now he's pleading for his instruction. So as we look at the six strategies for staying in step with God, we've seen the psalmist says to seek God's face, to consider your way, to keep God's commandments, and to remember God's law, to praise God's judgments, and accompany God's people. And this leads to three results, a recognition of who God is, a recognition of who we are, and then that leads to a plea for God's instruction. So tonight, let me ask you, are you staying in step with God? Perhaps partially in step. It's very easy when you're marching to get out of step. Uh, or get off of a step halfway, and maybe that's you tonight. What strategy is absent in your life? Are you not spending enough time pleading with the Lord, seeking his face? Are you not spending enough time in God's word? Are you associating with those who should not be close companions of you? If you're a believer tonight, you need to be in step with God. Look to his word. And if you're not a believer tonight, maybe you've listened to everything that I've said You come to church on a Sunday night for maybe the fellowship or or because you have nothing better to do. Maybe you're marching in a different army tonight. Know that the Lord is coming with his army in judgment. And you must repent, as the psalmist describes in verse 58, and plead with the Lord to be gracious to you. Repent of your sin and turn to Christ and live. So again... We have looked at staying in step with God. Are you in step with God this evening? Let's close in prayer. Our great God of highest heaven, we come before you. We praise you and glorify you that when we were marching in the enemy army at war with you, you called us, you saved us, you redeemed us. And not only that, you placed us in your army. Lord, help us to stay in step with you, with your character, with your word. May we look to the truths of your word. We're so thankful for your word. May it be a comfort to us uh, when we're afflicted. Uh, May it be a means of sanctification in our lives. I ask that you bless these dear people as they look to follow you. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.